Hey everyone, welcome to Sidetrack Adventures. This is Steve. Right now we're in New Mexico on historic Route 66 on a very cold and dreary day. But the weather actually fits with where we're going today because a few miles east of here is a town where one of the darkest events on Route 66 took place. So let's hop on Route 66, head east, and visit the town of Budville. We're starting out today's journey in, I guess, what can be considered San Fidel. But the reason I stopped here is because there's an old Whiting Brothers station here. Here's the old station. Whiting Brothers started in 1926, the same year Route 66 was created, and was kind of synonymous with Route 66 in New Mexico and Arizona, though there were locations in California and Texas too. The old wooden sign is actually still readable. It falling down in this way has probably helped protect this side from the elements and from vandals. Let's take a closer look here. At their height, there were over a hundred of these Whiting Brothers locations, with over 40 on Route 66 alone, but they started dying off in the 70s and 80s, though there is still one open in Moriarty, New Mexico. But this video is actually about a different garage in a different town. So let's head east on Route 66 and we'll visit the town that was nicknamed Bloodville. Route 66 is easily the most famous highway in the United States. And for about a half a century, it stretched from Chicago to Los Angeles, crossing through hundreds of small towns along the way. The town of Budville is a pretty small place, even by Route 66 standards. They never even bothered to list it on many maps. If not for the gruesome events that took place there, it would probably be all but forgotten. The alignments of Route 66 were constantly changing, and with a change in the mid-1930s that was set to bypass the town of Cubero, Howard Neal Rice, who was nicknamed Bud, saw an opportunity and opened a garage right next to the new alignment of the road. Along with his wife Flossie, they then opened a trading post and called it Budville. As the only automotive repair in the area, Bud was able to set his own prices, and he set them high. He also served as the justice of the peace for the area, and was known for setting steep fines to outsiders who dared to break traffic laws. Often in speed traps he arranged. Bud was well connected though, so much so that when he was convicted of assault, he was given a pardon by the governor. And when Interstate 40 was being built in the 1960s, he was able to make sure there was an exit right into Budville. And speaking of Budville, it looks like we've arrived. Here's the Dixie Bar. I'm glad someone was smart enough to get a Budweiser sponsorship in a town called Budville. The sign says since 1936. I've seen photos of this place in the 1940s and the building looks completely different. So the business may have been around since the 1930s, but this building hasn't. I'm told this was a popular stop for truckers. I like the operated by Lawrence and Lucy. Lawrence passed away in 2019, and this has been closed ever since. This place was originally called King's Cafe and Bar. I believe it opened in the 1950s. Its name was changed to Midway Cafe and Bar in 1978. Like everything else here, it's closed now. Here's Route 66 in front of us and Interstate 40 in the background. That little bit of distance in between these two roads killed small towns like this. And here's the most popular spot in Budville, the Budville Trading Post that was opened by Bud Rice in the 1930s and is a popular picture spot on Route 66. And also the site of three murders. On November 18, 1967, a stranger entered the trading post and began to argue with an employee, an 81-year-old woman named Blanche Brown. Bud Rice got involved and the stranger pulled out a gun and threatened to shoot Bud. Bud said, okay, go ahead, and the stranger did, 
three times. Blanche tried to jump on the gunman's back, but he shot her twice. Rice's wife Flossie was in a back room, and the gunman pulled her out, tied her up, taped her mouth shut, and pointed the gun at her head, but didn't shoot. The stranger made off with about $450. The scene was said to be such a mess, people began calling it Bloodville. There was also another witness, Nettie Buckley, a housekeeper who managed to hide out in the bathrooms. She actually witnessed the killings. At first, a Navy sailor traveling through the area with his family was arrested for the murders, but it was eventually determined it wasn't him. A man named Billy Ray White was eventually identified as the killer and went to trial for the murders in 1969, but Nettie Buckley, the only witness to the killings, had died of a heart attack before the trial and White was acquitted. White did get convicted of a jewelry store robbery in Louisiana and supposedly confessed to the Budville killings to his cellmate before taking his own life in prison. The story of Bloodville doesn't end there though. Flossie Rice remarried and her second husband was named Max Atkinson. He took over running the Budville trading post. You could see some of the old sleeper cabins the Rices would rent out back there. In August 1971, less than four years after the first murders, Max and his brother Philip pulled up to the trading post when someone opened fire on them. Max was hit in the leg and Philip was killed, three feet from where Bud Rice died four years earlier. The killer was never found. I wonder if we could see anything through the windows. Max Atkinson may have survived the shooting at the trading post, but two years later he would be shot to death during an argument with a butcher. And I really can't see anything. Here's a better shot. It doesn't really look like anything's in there. Some people do believe this place is haunted. Flossie Rice would remarry again, and her husband was pretty brave after what happened to her first two husbands but she died of natural causes in 1994. The trading post has been closed for decades now, but occasionally there's talk of reopening it. Now that we've explored Budville and its dark history, keeping in theme, we're gonna head about 10 miles further east to Route 66's infamous Dead Man's Curve. We're heading towards what's called Dead Man's Curve. But I should mention, there are quite a few roads out there that have a spot on them called Dead Man's Curve, and this isn't even the only one on Route 66. It seems like every road has a Dead Man's Curve on it somewhere. What made this section of Route 66 so dangerous is how sharp the turn is as you hug the cliff wall, while at the same time, the rock wall stops you from seeing ahead on the road. Additionally, with all the brush along the road and a river, this is a popular spot for deer to cross, giving you almost no time to see them. This part of the road was only part of Route 66 from 1926 to 1932, before it was realigned to where Interstate 40 is now. In researching Dead Man's Curve before coming out here, I was only able to find information on one fatal accident here, and that involved a pedestrian. That's not to say more didn't happen, but it seems that despite the name, more people were killed at the Budville Trading Company than Dead Man's Curve. So that ends what's obviously one of our more cheerful adventures. I promise next video, no murders. But thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up, consider subscribing, and we'll see you next week.